Hello everyone and welcome to our session, the need for security orchestration and automation. I'm Kalit and I will be your host for the day. Our speaker for today's session is Maria Elizabeth Dagasman, Cybersecurity Director at Big Four. Please note that the session will be in listen only mode and will last for about 40 to 50 minutes, out of which the last 10 minutes will be dedicated for Q&A. Requesting all the participants to post your questions in the Q&A window. Also, do note we have two criteria for certification. First, participants need to attend the complete webinar. And second, fill in the survey and the right answers to all the three questions based on the webinar, which will be sent to you later. Now about our speaker. Maria currently leads one of Big Four's extensive cybersecurity delivery centers in Manila, Philippines. She is the first female certified chief information security officer in the country and was recently recognized by Security Matters magazine, PWCA and WISCRA as one of Philippines top women in cybersecurity. She is a program director and lead security architect on the biggest security orchestration, automation and response platform deployments. She is highly focused on security architecture and emerging technology with relevant global work experience and having lived and worked across APAC region as head of security, incident response and threat intelligence. Maria has a track record of integrating security into business and technology operations and helping global leaders address their pressing security and risk concerns. Now, without taking much time, I would like to hand over the session over to you, Maria. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening and greetings from the Philippines. Whatever time zone you might be, wherever country you are, really a huge thank you for your interest and time for this webinar, right? So today in Cyber Talks, we will talk about the need for security automation in orchestration. So I'll quickly jump into the agenda. I know we have a lot of things to discuss on this webinar. So let's understand the problem in security operations. So do we have problems around people? Do we have problems around processes? Problems around tools or all of the above? Then let's cover the role of SOAR, or security orchestration, automation, and response. There would be certain case studies to showcase the impact of SOAR again against uh, security operations. We'll be talking about the SOAR journey, and then we will be tackling how do we see the post-pandemic world and the impact of SOAR on the post-pandemic world. So before I actually start, I want to share one of my favorite cybersecurity quotes by Stefan Napo, and it reads, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and few minutes of cyber incidents to ruin it. And I'll pause a bit, right? So revisiting the 2020 cybersecurity stats that we need to know, 41% of customers would actually stop buying from a business victim of a ransomware attack. So the impact of reputation loss in every organization is very big. Now let's understand the problems, right? Um, let's talk about the current state of security operations. So how many times have we heard our SOC colleagues say, analyst burnout is real? After a long day of security investigation or even just a, a normal day at work, so what is my average incident? Dwell time, is it too long, unacceptable? Now let's even add the entire COVID-19 pandemic into the equation, right? And let's tackle that in a bit. So manual security, security operations are really increasingly becoming expensive and ineffective as the number of alerts are exponentially growing given the scale of digital transformation, accelerated volume of new threats, and shortage of cybersecurity specialists globally. Even a result of a global information security survey actually states that the number one spending category in cybersecurity or the number one in the respondents' budgets is security operations center or SOC. 
that's why one of the biggest question is are security operation centers or SOCs fit for purpose? So again, let's go back to the entire GISS, which is the survey that finds that the performance of many organizations as well, the SOCs of their organizations has been very disappointing. So the report even mentioned that 26% say that their SOC identified their most significant breach over the past 12 months. This might be because, of course, many organizations continue to operate with first generation SOCs that require significant amounts of manual intervention. So first generation SOCs are really very reactive in approach and very highly manual. So this is really the problem that we want to address. And other noteworthy facts are hackers attack every 39 seconds. So on average, that's 2,244 times daily as well. And the average time to identify a breach, if you ask, is actually seven months, seven long months, right? So one of the most or the best correlation that we can get is we are being attacked really in machine speed, but we are just responding in human speed. Now, other things that you can see on the screen is digital transformation is changing the technology landscape in unprecedented ways. So in every digitalization, there's always a security risk and it's just increasing exponentially. Now, to manage this threat altogether, multiple discrete vendors are providing some form of security technology. But the problem is, how do we orchestrate them, right? So I could have a firewall, a proxy, an email security appliance, a data loss prevention, a SIEM, right? Security information and event management tool, a TIP or a threat intelligence platform, a UDBA, and so many other things. But how do those tools talk to each other, right? So what is the sequence? What is the entire workflow? And then the entire skill gap the skills gap comes in. It's just not shrinking. And now even adding the entire COVID-19 pandemic, as I mentioned earlier, we are seeing more attacks, more malware, more incidents. And going back to the initial statement, right? Analyst fatigue is so real. And there's a study that there's a 3 million shortage of cybersecurity professionals globally, which is just very huge. And that's our current state, and those are the things that we are actually trying to solve on our security operations. Now enter SOAR. So what is the role of SOAR in addressing the problems that we have already tackled or stated? So SOAR helps address the lack of integration between technologies by providing a capability that includes multiple features. And there could be a lot of different terminologies, but I, I really want to use four SOAR components that you can see here, right? Automation, orchestration, case management, and reporting and dashboarding. And most of the time, people would interchangeably use orchestration and automation as if they are the same thing. But going back to the example earlier that we have had, say I do have a firewall, an email security, seen and all those tools, right? So orchestration is really about directing different products in your security tool set to work together in a very complementary way, which not only gives you more robust security, but it means that the security analyst doesn't have to do the correlation work manually as well. So on the other hand, uh, automation is executing automated actions across the different security tools in seconds versus hours or more if performed manually. Now, the third one, our case management, is really having that case template that replicate your manual standard operating procedures, which is really very important to have that single pane of glass. And finally, the last one is 
important to be able to easily measure the state of security operations and really to drive towards com uh, continuous improvement over time. So SOAR can really track and have customized dashboards, for example, as per your case management fields and key metrics, such as mean time to detect, um, mean time to respond, incident dwell time, and so on. Now, dashboards consolidate all critical information really needed to understand the current state of your security operations. And reports provide, of course, executive level and detailed technical reporting for any event or case. And those are the key and very important components of SOAR. Automation, orchestration, case management, and reporting and dashboarding. Now let's move to the first case study, right? So how does a SOC analyst spend their time manually or manually investigating a phishing attack? So phishing, of course, remains to be one of the most common cyber incidents. And even in 2020, it nearly doubled in frequency. Like 75% of organizations around the world experienced some kind of phishing attack in 2020. Another 35% experienced spear phishing, which are highly personalized. And 65% faced VC attacks or business email compromise. Now, let's look at this workflow closely, right? So say, I'm the soft analyst, and I'll manually grab the alert, extract URLs, IPs, domains, hashes, attachments, uh, categorize the incident, and create a ticket, all done manually. Then I'll do the investigation, I'll scan the contents to see reputations or if malicious content is found. Now, if an artifact is malicious, I will create a ticket and notify the IT team and I'll find out whether the user clicked links or downloaded the content. So be manually or automatically depending on your tool. Then I will analyze next steps, right? I'll do the containment and analysis, again, manually send notifications to appropriate teams to confirm if phishing URL has been taken down, then a ticket creation, if any malicious code was downloaded, create ticket to block the phishing email, create ticket to block URL, so many manual things. Then after that, I will send notifications where the victim machine is actually located. I would try to identify compromise files, wipe and restore, and then close the ticket. So that entire process from grabbing the alert manually down to closing the incident can be 88 minutes or more, considering a lot of manual steps. Now, this particular slide is after automation or after store, right? You can see all the yellow ones there is already supported by SOAR. So I'm the SOAR tool, for example, again, the yellow one, it will automatically ingest the email, automatically create a ticket, do the detection and investigation automatically. And somewhere in between, you can see the black line, there will be an analyst intervention on the next actions to be performed. So containment, eradication, and recovery the entire thing could be automated already. So this process will take 15 minutes versus 88 minutes, as you've seen, that was done manually beforehand, right? So imagine if you have 500 incidents in a month and 60% of that is fishing. So that's already a lot. So let's look at the next case study. So this is the SOAR financial benefits. So again, imagine if it takes an analyst 10 minutes to triage, five minutes to analyze, and another 15 minutes to escalate and respond manually. So you can see there the manual activities versus the automated ones, the versus five minutes, right, using SOAR end-to-end. -end that's already 83% reduction in costs and almost 800K savings a year. And this is only considering a very small enterprise. 
Now, we've already talked about problems earlier in the case studies. So let's summarize how we saw optimizing the effectiveness of operational security. So SOAR reduces time required to respond and recover from incident. As what we have shown in the workflow earlier, right? If you look at the incident response lifecycle, preparation, detection, analysis, containment, eradication, and recovery, or even up to post-incident activities, SOAR can automate certain actions within those phases. So number two, SOAR reduces breach exposure time and minimizes impact cost to the organization. Now from the statistic, the average breach exposure time lasts almost 11 months from the breach to containment, right? Imagine that. So number three, it optimizes value of each analyst by focusing on unusual anomalies. As we keep on saying, automate the mundane tasks, the repetitive active activities, and really just divert the focus on analyzing unusual anomalies. And that's the goal. The fourth one is SOAR optimizes the use of security technology in the ecosystem. So some organizations may have tons of technologies, tools with no orchestration, Thus, some of them may just be wasted, may not be configured, not used properly, just not optimized at all. And then the last is SOAR streamline organizational and security incident response process. So the use of SOAR playbooks to have a very consistent security incident response is really one of the key benefits of SOAR and to end. Now let's talk about the SOAR journey. So really from creating a vision all the way to having a clear center of excellence. Now, trying to have a SOAR vision governance and operating model, and I keep on telling this to everyone, is really like walking into a newly built home. So envision it without any furniture, no paint, plain white canvas. Now, do I need to place a sofa, a coffee table, a dining set, or a TV? What is the proper alignment, for example? What is best fit for purpose? What do I really need to achieve that would provide me the proper ROI, for example? So a sort of vision, governance, and operating model definitely needs to be there at the onset just like how you will envision the design and theme of your newly built home. So that's the first. Now, selecting a SOAR product that will be best fit for purpose is also very important. So will the technical design meet your case management requirements, your metrics, your reporting requirements? How is the API or system integration flexibility or supportability? Now, those things are very important to check on your product selection when it comes to SOAR. Now, number three is how will my SOAR platform be designed and architected, right? So consider business continuity plans based on your SOAR system criticality. So also consider catering the foreseeable use cases in the next three to five years. You will definitely want your platform to scale. Don't just think about what's happening at the moment, really need to foresee those use cases that will be present for three to five years. So alongside that, consider methods of deployment. So if you can see right here, there would be a solar product deployment that we normally talk about just product deployment, right? But how do we push individual playbook deployment as well? Should I do a waterfall approach or a sprint approach? We often need to consider setting up DevOps pipeline for this as well. The next one is manual playbook optimization, which is very important because without a consistent process, we cannot really decide what needs to be automated. And then next is playbook prioritization criteria. 
what are the playbooks that we need to prioritize? What should be my integration points, for example? What should I be ingesting, et cetera? So very important that I need to note, or everyone needs to note, is the integration with high fidelity ingestion sources. So it's the concept of garbage in and garbage out, right? So imagine having a very noisy sim, and those alerts will be fed into the SOAR platform and automatic tickets. Imagine having 100 tickets per hour because your scene is very noisy. It will just be crazy. Now, the next item would be, how should I design my case management, dashboarding and reporting? How do I do continuous design and deployment until we actually reach the center of excellence, which is everyone's goal for this entire sort of story. So those are the things that we really need to consider, again, from vision, governance, and operating model until we reach the COE. Now, I do get this question a lot, right? And everyone keeps on asking, so how do I prepare to implement SOAR? What are the prerequisites? And I usually answer these questions with these things on the screen. One, a well-documented procedure. Of course, if we automate a poorly designed, poorly defined process, just like anything else that we are automating, it's going to be a poorly automated process. That's why the requirements gathering is very important. We need to have a very good user story. Number two is the inventory of all the tools and understanding how these tools tie up together with your process and the user story. I'm squeezing it at number three, which is a properly configured ingestion source, right? So I did mention earlier that it's really a garbage in, garbage out. A lot of uh, people usually mistaken a SOAR and a SIEM. Again, a SOAR platform is not a SIEM. Or a security information and event management, it's not supposed to function like a SIEM in terms of correlation and alerting. Now, the fourth one is organizational risk appetite. So as an example, some organizations would be okay to have autom automatic blocking of firewall rules, for example, proxy, et cetera. And some would not be okay. Some would even require a service request and approval before you even do those tasks. So those things really need to be set reviewed before anything else one organization's risk appetite to be different from another. And then the fifth one is good baseline metrics. So most organizations would target, say, 20% reduction in MPTR, right? um, mean time per response. But without the baseline metrics that we need to compare it to, it would not really paint a very good picture altogether. So again, very important are prerequisites and SOAR, again, well-documented procedure, uh, an inventory of all the tools, understanding of how the tools are actually correlated, what is your organizational risk appetite for processes, for good baseline metrics, and of course, the properly configured ingestion sources. Now, moving on to the post-pandemic world, right? And there are so many predictions beyond 2021. So one is work from home, or one is work from home is here to stay. We keep on hearing about it, right? Many will continue to work from home and there will be continuous digital transformation. So along this, cyber criminals will capitalize on the shifts. There will be a lot of new vulnerabilities for criminals to exploit. The volume of scams is expected to increase and cyber criminals will even be more creative. So there will be persistent problems in security operations and that's what we are pursuing. Now with all this, even the post pandemic world, the orchestration and automation space or SOAR 
will continue to be one of the fastest growing subsectors within cybersecurity. And with that, I'm closing the presentation and we'll hand it back over to Khaled to open the Q&A. And it's really been a pleasure to have shared my point of view on this topic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. I, it was such an informative session and by looking at the attendance that we have from our audiences and as well as the questions that are pouring in, I'm pretty sure they found it really, really helpful. So uh, me, before we start the poll, uh, I would just like to inform our attendees that today's session is in sync with EC Council certification, ECIH, that is EC Council Certified Incident Handler, which maps to the incident handler or an incident manager role. Anyone with ECIH certification is eligible for 10,000 to 11,000 plus job vacancies globally with an average salary of $76,000 per annum. If you're interested to learn more about this program, kindly take part in the poll that's going to be conducted now. Maria, can we start with a Q&A? Yeah, sure. What is the difference of SOIR and SEIM? So it's a very good question and I do get this question a lot, right? So SEIM is all your log aggregation tool. So it's basically the one that correlates fire rules all together. So SEIM is one of the ingestion sources of a sort. So meaning if something fires in your SEIM, I can get it as an automatic ingestion in my SOAR, create a ticket in my SOAR, or do a query back to SIEM, because those are all the correlation rules are coming from. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so moving on. Another question by Vince. Uh, is it okay to an organization to have a SOAR, but they don't have an existing playbook for a security incident? It will be very hard. <laughs> so as I have presented earlier, one of the prerequisites is really a good SOP. So we need to have a manual security operations process first. It's, it needs to be a very good use case to get it automated. So without a very consistent process, it will be very hard to automate. Okay, another question is by Darwin, and the question is, what is your major challenge setting up the SOAR in your organization, and how did you address it? Further, how do you rate your SOAR implementation? Is it perfect, or any room for improvement? There will always be room for improvements, uh, for sure, right? So challenges would be because i did mention about the prerequisites one of the things that will always be a lesson learned is the risk appetite of your organization right as i did mention maybe you're not in contact with your id team or your service management team or your other teams outside cybersecurity. actually those teams need to go hand in hand and you, you shouldn't be just in silo because other people need to work hand in hand with you. You, you will need a firewall team, a proxy team, an email, email security team or an email team, active directory team, for example. So if they don't know your journey or what you want to achieve in your automation activities, you will fail definitely. So that's, I think, one of the biggest challenges or one of the biggest lessons learned for everyone. Thank you so much. Another question is by Christopher. Is there a SOAR tool? Why enterprise companies still suffer data breach like happened in SolarWind supply chain attack on which the payload malware undetected or dormant in two weeks? Yeah, so it's a combination of a lot of things, right? So the first answer to the question is yes, there are a lot of SOAR tools in the market and you can actually look it up in the internet. There's just a lot. 
There are a lot of community-based tools as well that is free to be downloaded in the internet too. Um, the thing is, you cannot really, I cannot say you cannot really prevent breaches, right? It will always be there. So the good hygiene needs to be in place. Again, a good, a good threat modeling approach, a good correlation rule, and a good playbook that will trigger those incident responses whenever there's a breach that will happen. So it's not really just a silo process or a silo thing altogether. Those things need to come together. Okay, Jamaico says, how to prioritize what actions to automate and orchestrate? Is there a guideline? <laughs> yeah, so another question that I get a lot in, in all the talks, right? So I, I usually tell people that I do have two different things to this. So one is really on the operations point of view, and one is on the development point of view. So meaning I'm the soft analyst or I'm the developer, right? So on a soft perspective, what's important to you is the playbook importance, right? So meaning it, re it refers to how important the playbook is for incident response process. Now you will think about playbook versatility as well. So it refers to the flexibility of the playbook to be used in different scenarios or incident categories when doing an incident response. So small chunks of utility playbooks, for example, that can be used again and again because it's so versatile. Now, there is a thing that we call quantitative impact. So it means or it refers to a measurable result realized from automation. Of course, if you're on the business or you're in the SOC, right? It's very important to have high quantitative results to be provided with a greater impact. And I think last on the SOC point of view is the time save. So it really refers to the time that can be saved by automating an incident response process. So meaning on the SOC point of view, all those things need to be considered. How important is the playbook to me. So again, say for example, your top 10 incidents is one, two, three, four, five to 10, right? So we focus on that because those are the things that could be important, could be mundane activities. So how is the playbook versatility again? How can I reuse those small chunks of automated utility playbooks on a bigger chunk of playbook? For example, time saved uh, and then time, um, time saved, and the quantitative impact, as I mentioned. So those are the four things that are very important in the operations point of view. Now, if you're a security engineer, right? So meaning you're the software developer on the side, you would not care more about the operations point of view. You will basically be concerned of the time taken to automate a particular type of incident response process. So this could take me maybe one day versus two weeks. Of course, I will automate first the one day because it's the quick win. Now, out of the box functionality, if it's available. So there are so many OOB, OOB or out of the box functionality, which is also available within the SOAR platform itself. So if it's already out of the box, then there will be very little tweaking that needs to be involved already. And of course, important for me, if I'm the developer, would be the input data sources, right? So what it means is it's the format of the input data sources. So the structured inputs may be more impactful for us to automate. So that's, that's the third. And then the fourth one could be error frequency altogether. So of course, it refers to the likelihood of automation runs to experience technical and connectivity errors. So very different things. Um, in, in terms of point of view, of course, the soft, the business side, the operation side will have different prioritization approach versus if you're the SOAR engineer or you're the developer, you will have a different 
uh, point of view as well in terms of what they prioritize. And thanks for the question. Okay, another one uh, from John. Can you share a use case on vulnerability management? <laughs> so that's a very good question as well. You know, before every use cases are mostly about incident response, right? So we're seeing a lot more use cases at the moment related to VM, related to threat intel, for example, and all those other stuff, right? So let's say, for example, I'm a vulnerability management analyst. I'm a VM guy. So what are the things that I am doing manually today? So from time to time, I would conduct uh, regular scans or even ad hoc scans, for example. So I would check the vulnerability context, for example. This may have a CVSS of 9 and above with exploit. So I will filter that. I will make my own tractor analyze and raise uh, tickets for manual remediation or patching and so on, right? So this my entire process has to be manual now, if that's the end-to-end -end process. Of course, in between the vulnerability management, you will have to wait for your change window if you're patching as well. So you need to be on standby, right? So if I will use SOAR in the end-to-end -end vulnerability management, I'll start my process from ingesting data from the vulnerability management scanner, for example. So that will be automated already. So typically, they already have a plug-in for me to filter, as I mentioned, all CVSS 9 and above with exploit, for example. So I will ingest all the data, dump it in my SOAR external database. And I will trigger another automation of creating a service ticket or a service request ticket to patch the vulnerable systems. So another, another use case is querying an approved service request ticket to trigger patching as well. So from the vulnerability all the way to patching, SOAR can query the status of the service request um so that once it's already approved we just check the other fields such as machine details the change window so on and so forth and we can trigger an automated uh, patching as well using SOAR so those are good use cases from vulnerability management all the way to patching actually Okay, another question by Andre is, uh, source solutions are pretty expensive. What's the most effective way to estimate the ROI of SOAR integration in the organization? The ROI actually is pretty simple, right? So, so if you can remember the table that I presented earlier, the things that I've shown, it's really manually having a baseline of what you're doing now so meaning all the manual steps how many minutes how many hours am i actually doing it versus with sword so that's actually your roi whenever you go to your boss go to your head of security or the CISO saying i i do want a business case this is my business case because these are the things that i will save but more of the savings in terms of dollar value for example there are other benefits of course you will have a more streamlined approach to things. Um, the analyst burnout could be prevented because definitely the L1 would be uplifted to L1.52 and so on and so forth. So the benefit is just not monetary, but there are also qualitative benefits that can have a very big impact when you deploy a SOAR platform. Okay, another question by Ramon. What's the advantages of automation except for time management? Oh, that, that's, a, that's a question that I have already answered. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Sure. So there's one. It's a pretty complicated one. Okay. Basically, I think SOAR is implemented to complement the cumbersome workload of an analyst, such as analysts are still required to do some decisive action. Or is it possible that SOAR is completely automated without the intervention of an analyst? We don't recommend at all that it's an end to end process. Our goal is not to automate it end to end. An analyst still needs to do all the, not all the decision points, but the very important decision points still has to be made. Okay, uh, I think we'll take the last one for the evening. Uh, it's from Sanjay. You mentioned about MTD reduction from 88 minutes to 15 minutes. Do you observe by what percent false positive has come down? So the false positive ratio will actually come from the seam, not from the SOAR, because the seam is the one who's doing all the correlation. So if you look at the end-to-end SOAR process, right? So let, let's step back a bit, and it's a very good question. You know, in an ideal scenario, I like to link up everything in the MITRE attack framework, for example, right? So identify the threats, control deficiencies along the data flow paths, for example. So it could be privilege escalation, exfiltration, lateral movement, persistence, and so on. So we do threat modeling to determine the control gaps and the need for security monitoring. And then the use cases will be developed based on the control gaps attack surface, the threat vectors available for threat actors in existing data sources, right? So this use cases will be established as correlation searches for continuous monitoring, alerting, and reporting. That's the same part exactly. So again, continuous monitoring, correlation searches, alerting are all done in the scene. And then subsequently, the playbooks, the ingestion criteria will be assessed and updated to develop automation and technical implications in the SOAR. So the false positives are in the scene. Again, I will ingest those things. If it triggers an alert, I will create an automated ticket to the SOAR function. So again, the entire life cycle from the MITRE attack framework, for example, threat modeling, scene correlation, to SOAR playbook creation, it will be a continuous loop. Altogether. So just envision the flow again from, from threat modeling to seam and then to soar as an incident response flow. And of course, going back again to the entire threat modeling stuff. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Maria, for joining us. Uh, I think it was such an interesting session for all of our attendees they enjoyed a lot and i think we just missed out on a few more questions but due to time constraints we can we'll take them some another time or we'll pass on the questions to maria and she can answer to you so thank you so much for joining us it was really a pleasure maria having you on board thank you for all of our attendees to joining in thank you so much everyone really appreciate the time and effort yes thank you you may now disconnect your lines. Bye-bye. Take care.